We're in Galatians chapter 4, and we're going to talk about lives of emptiness this morning. Lives of emptiness. So let's uh, start reading in verse number 4. Galatians chapter 4, starting with verse 4. When the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if you are a son, then you are an heir of God through Christ. But then, indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. But now, after you have known God, or rather you are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years, and I am afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. So the Galatians, remember, Paul has been saying again and again throughout this letter to them that salvation is by God's grace through faith in Jesus. That's not only how we are saved, but it's how we stay saved. We stay saved not by our works or by our goodness or by us trying harder. If we're saved by grace through faith, how do we stay saved? By grace through faith. How is it that God changes our lives once we're saved? By grace through faith in Jesus. Last week, we saw three benefits of salvation, and the first is redemption, then adoption, and then an inheritance. Redemption, remember, means to be bought with a price or for a price and then set free. So when we are saved, we are bought with a price. The price was the life of Jesus. And then God sets us free, free from the wrath of the Father, free from sin, free from the law, free from death. And then we are adopted, and adopted means to take and make someone else your adult son. And the benefit of adoption was that the adopted son became the heir of the Father. He received everything that the Father had to give. But the Galatians, Paul was concerned about them because they were actually surrendering the richness of grace and faith in Jesus to go back to the law of Moses. The Judaizers said, hey, you guys are advancing spiritually by following the Old Testament rules. But in reality, Paul says that they were going back to their lives before Christ. When you go back to the law, to live by the law, you're actually moving backward spiritually and going back to what you were and the way you lived before you were saved. They were trading knowledge for ignorance, freedom for slavery, the fullness of God for the emptiness of religion. Why would anyone want to go backward? And yet these false teachers had convinced them that that was the way to go. Now everybody worships something. Even atheists worship something. Atheists claim that atheism is not a religion. Yes, it is. It's a religion of self-worship. You believe that you are the climax of 
of existence, you yourself, humanity, is the apex of this world for you. So we either worship the creator or we worship the creature. It's one or the other. And in Romans chapter 1, Paul talks to the Romans and he points that out, that everyone worships something. You either worship the creator or you worship a lie that leads you to worship the creation. The unsaved are slaves to their sinful hearts and slaves to this fallen age, Galatians 1.4. They are slaves to the law, Galatians 3.23. And now Paul adds something else. He adds that unsaved people are slaves to idols. Look at verse number 8 again. But then indeed, when you did not know God, and the word know there is epigenosis, which means to know, not just in your head, but it means to know by your knowledge of experience. He's saying to them, you know beyond any doubt because of something you've experienced when you met Jesus. You changed. When you did not know God, what did we do? We served those which by nature are not gods. Now the cities of Galatia, remember Galatia is a, we call it a territory or a state or a county in modern day Turkey. And the cities there, the four major cities of Galatia, were devoted to pagan worship. They had temples there specifically to two major gods. And I've got some pictures of them here for you. Those four major cities worshipped the god Zizamin, or you might know her by the name Sibyl. Have you heard of the Sibylline prophecies? Anybody heard of that? It's real popular today in the New Age thing, but it goes back to the ancient world where the prophets and prophetesses of this goddess would speak in tongues and then give prophecies. And you can actually find these prophecies still in writing today. So they worshipped Zizamine, and I've got another picture of her. This is an older carving of her. She was considered the goddess of fertility and sex and nature, creation kind of things. You heard the name Gaia? Gaia was big in the 60s and 70s as a name. Gaia was Mother Earth or Mother Nature. This is a picture of her, and you see she's a large girl, but she's large because she gives birth to everything. You got to be large to give birth to everything. So they worshipped her. They also worshipped and had temples that were devoted to this guy. Let me turn off the lights so maybe it's a little easier to see him. That is a statue of Zeus. And you see he's got the eagle there representing his authority. He's got a staff in one hand. In his right hand he holds a ball that represents the earth. And in the ball is Nike, the goddess of victory. So when you wear Nike shoes and Nike stuff, it goes back to this idea of victory. So this is Zeus. This is an actual statue of him. The ones that were in um, the most prominent ones in temples, and some of these statues were more than 40 feet high. They were made of marble. They were made of, of wood. And then they would take and put bronze or gold over them. This statue is a replica. Originally, his beard and his hair were all of gold. Um, his clothing was made of gold. 
beautiful statue. Zeus was the chief of all the gods, the head god of all the gods. And then I've got a photo here of him up close. And the stories of these gods are bizarre. They, you know, the, the first two gods, they got into a war and they had a fight and they started having kids and kids would pop out of their thighs and all kinds of weird stuff. But Zeus here, the chief god, was actually married to his sister. Zeus, next. There's another god I want to show you here. This is Hermes, or he's known as Mercury. Any of you old enough to remember the old Mercury dimes yeah. that had a picture of Hermes on them? Mm -hmm. Okay. Named after him, and he was the messenger of the gods. So when you wanted, when the gods had something to say, the gods would send Hermes with the message. And you can't quite see on his hat, but the next photo will show you. Here he is. Does anybody recognize him? FTD florist. Yeah. They will get your flowers to you right away. And he was pictured not only with wings on his hat, but I don't have a picture of him. Uniquely, guess what he had on his shoes? Wings. Wings on his shoes so he could bring the message, which again goes back to Nike and the shoe company. One of the reasons why they named the shoe company. Bringing the message of victory in sport. All right? Now, why did I bring up these three gods? Well, one, because Zizamine was a major goddess in Galatia, but so was Zeus. Mercury, or Hermes, I showed you pictures of because I want you to go back to the book of Acts. Book of Acts, chapter number 14. Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14 is part of the history of Paul's first visit to Galatia. Acts chapter 14 is the history of Paul's first visit to Galatia. And uh, let's just start at verse 1. It happened in Iconium, which was one of the big cities of Galatia, that they went together to the synagogue. This is Paul and Barnabas at the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke that a great multitude both of Jews and Greeks believed but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren therefore Paul and Barnabas stayed there a long time speaking boldly in the Lord who was bearing witness to the word of his grace granting signs and wonders done by Paul and Barnabas's hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when a violent attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to abuse and to stone them, when the gospel goes into a place, it always stirs up hatred and persecution. Don't believe me? Stand on a street corner in downtown Portland and preach the gospel and see what happens. If you're preaching the gospel that you are a sinner, a lawbreaker, condemned and under the wrath of God, you better believe people will not like what you're saying. And then when you tell them that there is only one remedy, and that is by faith in Jesus... You're going to have even more enemies. Verse 6, Paul and Barnabas became aware of it, and they fled to Lystra and to Derby, cities of Lyconia and the surrounding region. 
and they were preaching the gospel there. And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking, and Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. And the man leapt up and walked. Now when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas, they said, was Zeus, and Paul, they said, was Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gate, intending to offer sacrifices with the multitudes. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude and cried out, saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the very same nature as you, and we preach to you that you should turn from these useless things. What useless things? Zeus and Hermes and all their gods. You should turn from all these useless things, turn to the living God who made the heaven and made the earth and made the sea and made all the things that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, God did not leave himself without witness in that God did good. He gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons. He filled our hearts with food and with gladness. And with these sayings, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from still sacrificing to them. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconian came there and have persuading the multitudes, they stoned Paul, dragged him out of the city thinking he was dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he got up, went back into the city, glutton for punishment. Yeah. And the next day, then he departed with Barnabas and went on to Derby. The story goes on. It gets even more exciting if, if we kept reading. But you get the idea. Part of the worship of these gods, Zeus and Zizamine and Hermes and all the other ones. By the way, Zizamine. She was called the mother of the gods, the savior who hears our prayers. She was called the mother of God. Some of us, that makes a little ringing bell in our heads. Worship of Zizamine and Zeus meant observing lucky days. I don't know which days are lucky for you, but they had lucky days. And they had horoscopes that they would follow. They'd celebrate religious holidays. They would engage in homosexual behavior and other perversions in public. In the city of Rome, the worship of Zizamine was illegal because the homosexuality took place in public, in the streets. They would castrate one another in the streets in their worship of Zizamine. The Romans were okay with homosexuality as long as it was behind closed doors. But in public, they banned the worship of Zizamine. They bring food and offerings to their statues, which always kind of gets me because uh, there's a Vietnam, a Vietnamese restaurant we used to go to and a Chinese restaurant we go to and they've got a, a little statue out at the door and at the Vietnamese place at least, it's got a little candle and it's got a little bowl of water and an orange or some other little goodies. And it's amazing, they must really feed their God a lot because the plate is never empty. 
So the God must either eat a lot, so they have to keep refilling the God's tray, or the God doesn't eat anything. I'm not sure which it is. When Paul and Barnabas got to the city of Lystra on that first journey, and that lame man was healed, the two evangelists were assumed to be Zeus and Hermes. Now, in history, Zeus was always pictured as an old man, but Hermes was young and did all the speaking. Now, why would they assume Barnabas was Zeus? My guess is Barnabas was old, Paul was young, and guess which of the two did the talking? Paul. That's why they thought Paul was the messenger, Hermes. And the legend of Galatia was that there was a time when Zeus and Hermes visited one of their cities. And Zeus and Hermes came in disguise, and they walked around town looking for kindness, looking for someone to show them some kindness. And the town refused to show them kindness. Then as they were on their way out, they found an old man who welcomed Zeus and Hermes to their home. And he and his little old wife served Zeus and Hermes dinner, and then gave them lodging for the night. Zeus and Hermes came to destroy the city. But because they found this kind couple, they decided to let the kind couple live and destroy the rest of the city anyway. Now the story was important, the legend was important, because Galatia became known as a hospitality center. You could go to Galatia, they would welcome you with open arms. Why? Because they feared that maybe the two visitors that just came to town were Hermes and Zeus again, coming to destroy us. So to save ourselves from destruction by Zeus and Hermes, anybody that comes, we're going to welcome them and show them hospitality and kindness. So when Paul and Barnabas showed up, an old man and a young man who did all the talking, in their minds, the legend came back. They thought of that, and they didn't want to be destroyed. Well, what happens when a god or two gods come to visit? And they perform a miracle of healing a man who has never before walked. That's got to be Zeus, and it's got to be Hermes. So let's bring the whole town together and offer sacrifices and offerings and worship these two. Because they didn't want to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. They weren't worshiping because they loved Zeus and loved Hermes. They worshiped because they were scared to death of them. Because if we don't worship... If we don't do the right thing, if we don't live the right way, if we don't do the right good deeds, what will the gods do? Destroy us. And it wasn't a relationship where the people loved their gods. It was a relationship of fear of what the gods would do to you if you weren't good or you didn't do the right religious things. You can see why the Galatians were so entangled in keeping the law that the Judaizers taught them. Because they'd grown up all their lives thinking if we don't perform the right way, Zeus and Hermes will hate us. Then when they became Christians and abandoned the message of grace and faith, what's the only thing left? Fear that if we don't follow all the rules... God will hate us. God will punish us. God will unsave us. He'll kick us out of his kingdom and we'll lose our salvation. But Paul preached the gospel and he made many disciples until the Jews came 
and said, you can't believe a word this guy says. Stirred up the crowd so that they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city like a dead raccoon to be eaten by the wild animals. But Paul here in Galatians, in our text in Galatians, he reminds the Galatians of what they used to be. They used to be pagan idol worshipers. The gold and the marble and the ivory images of false gods that they used to worship were not really gods at all. And if we had time, I'd take you to Isaiah 44 where the prophet talks about you've made these idols of, you take a tree, you cut down the tree, you carve part of the tree, and you set it up in your kitchen, and you worship it. The rest of the tree you just chop down, you cut into kindling, and burn in the fire. That's hypocrisy. It's nonsense. You take one stick, half of it is your God, and the other half you make your dinner with. Isaiah 44 is a great chapter. These gods are nothing, but their worship is not innocent. It's not playful, it's not funny, and it's not harmless. Idols, according to the scripture, idols represent or are images of demons. 1 Corinthians 10, 19 through 21, Leviticus 17, verse number 7, Deuteronomy 32, 16 and 17, Psalm 106, verse 37, Revelation 9, 20. These pagan idols and images are not harmless. They are pictures of demons. Paul, for instance, warned the Corinthians that fellowship, the word koinonia, to be partners, to be in common in rituals or ceremonies to these gods, is the same as demon worship. You walk in and you see the little Buddha down by the door. You give him an offering, take a penny out, and throw it in the tray. You are worshiping a demon in doing that. And Paul says, how can you do that? We watched a documentary just very recently where a group of young Americans were in Southeast Asia, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, those areas. And they visited different Buddhist and Hindu Shinto shrines where they bowed in front of the statues, they rang bells, Ringing the bell is a form of prayer in those religions. Yeah. That every time you ring the bell, you are praying and worshiping that idol, that God. Yeah. They uh, stood in different Hindu prayer poses. They hung Buddhist prayer flags. They offered incense and food to idols. Wow. What they were doing was they were worshiping Satan and demons and didn't realize it. And Paul's point in the Corinthians, but his point to the Galatians is, if you're saved, how can you do that? How can you do that? If you claim to be a follower of Jesus, how can you bow or worship or offer prayers to a demon? Christians cannot participate in Satanism and Christ at the same time. It's spiritual prostitution. That's what Paul calls it to the Corinthians. You are prostitutes. Flirting with demons is a betrayal of the one who bought you and to whom is your husband. He's your husband. He's the husband of the church. And yet the church is worshiping statues and demons and praying to them and offering them gifts. Paul equates going back to the law as the same as worshiping the demon statues. You notice that the statues are never ugly. They're always beautiful. 
We were watching a, a movie last night, a, an Indian movie, and it started out with people worshiping the god Ganesh, who is portrayed as an elephant with six arms. And Ganesh is the god of blessing or prosperity. So when you want something to go well in your life, you offer prayers to Ganesh or bring him gifts or bring him offerings or sing songs to him or whatever the case may be. And the story of how Ganesh, who has, he's human from the neck down, got an elephant head and six arms is bizarre. I won't even try to go into it. And yet the world is full of these things and the images are not ugly. Do you think a demon that ever revealed his true appearance would have people worshiping him? If he showed himself for what he really was, do you think people would say, ooh, this is a God I want to hang on my wall? And yet Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he said, this is why Satan and his demons and his ministers appear as angels of light so that they can deceive you. A lot of the Hindu statues, the, the gods are beautiful. If you look at them, they are beautiful. They are attractive. Even Ganesh the elephant is a good looking guy. I mean, it's a good looking elephant head. Why? Because if they appeared as they really were, it'd scare the daylights out of everybody. The head of the demons in Hinduism has ten heads. But if you look at the picture of him, he still isn't a bad-looking guy. He's got a big smile on, on each of his ten heads, and, you know, who knows? Going back to the law is the same as worshiping Ganesh or Buddha or Vishnu, which is the same as worshiping the devil himself. Apart from faith in Jesus, nobody knows God. Eternal life, Jesus said, means to know the Father. And the only way to know the Father, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And you can go into those homes in India and you will see literally on their walls a picture of Jesus, a picture of Mary, a picture of Ganesh, a picture of Vishnu, a picture of Shiva, because they want to make sure they have all their bases covered. They're worshiping and praying to all the gods so that nobody's left out. So it's kind of like the way it was where uh, Abraham originally was from. They had these different gods for different, to make sure. Different they... gods for different things. Yeah. Yep, that's how it is. Different gods for different things. If you want to have children, you pray to this goddess. If you want rain in your field, you pray to this goddess. If you want prosperity in a business venture, you pray to this god. Yep. But Christianity is not just us knowing God, but it's God knowing us first. God knows us first. Look again at your text, Galatians 4, verse number 8. But then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not really gods. But now, after you've come to know God, or rather you are known by God. See, if you, you may think you know God, but until you know God through Jesus, by grace through faith, you don't know him, and he doesn't know you. And the only way that you can know him is if he knows you first. We love him because he first loved us. We know him because he first knew us. 
Romans chapter 8 says that he knew, knew us before the world began. He chose us. He predestined us before the world began. It's beautiful. So how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be slaves? So the first point is there are empty idols they were worshiping, but the second is empty shadows. After the Exodus, the Jewish people continually wanted to go back to slavery in Egypt. Read the book of Exodus and the book of Numbers. Every time something got tough, what did the Jews want to do? Take us back to Egypt. At least we had good food there. Yes, they beat us. Yes, they kept us in slavery. Yes, we had no rights. But at least our tummies were filled and we were safe. And so they wanted, because of the security and the comfort, they wanted to go back to what they knew. And Paul is warning the Galatians here, you are in the very steps of going back to your paganism by following the law. He could have written, you've decided to follow Jesus, now there's no going back. Or... Every bridge is burned behind you. So what are you saying? Because walking by what you see is easier than trusting the unknown. It's easier for me to do things that I can see and I know that are religious or spiritual. It's easier to do that than to trust God by faith that he's pleased with me just because I'm his. That's why he's pleased with me. He's not pleased with me because I perform. He's pleased with me just because I'm his kid. And he's only pleased with me as his kid because he's pleased with his son. And three times in the Gospels, the Father spoke from heaven of Jesus this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Why is God pleased with you? Because he's pleased with Jesus. That's grace by faith. Can you trust today that God is pleased with you only because of who Jesus is? Or do you think you've got to do something or believe something or give something? You see the danger the Galatians were facing? Giving up the power of the gospel for a religion of works to try and please God, to try and stay saved or try to get his favor or his blessing is slavery. It's a return to the weak and the beggarly, empty, shadowy religion and elements of this world, of sin, of fallenness. A person who wants to obey the law, James 2.10 says, must keep all of it. Martin Luther wrote, the law is weak and poor. The sinner is weak and poor. Two feeble beggars trying to help each other. They cannot do it. They only wear each other out. But through Christ, a weak and poor sinner is revived and enriched unto eternal life. We're saved and we are kept saved by God's grace through the gift of faith in Christ Jesus. The Galatians were being tricked into following religious holidays, Sabbath days, new moons, feasts and seasons and Sabbath years. If you read the book of Colossians chapter 2, you find the same thing. They tried to trap the Colossians into following religious holidays like Passover, the Feast of Tabernacles. But observing religious holidays, thinking that God's going to like you better. When God's liking, if you want to use that word, comes only one way. By God's grace, 
alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So observing religious holidays and thinking you're getting something out of it is no different than sitting down at the feet of a statue of Zeus and making a sacrifice to him. Same thing. And I know a lot of churches in this country have started getting into the religious holidays of ancient Judaism. That's the same as worshiping Zeus. It's empty religion that has no bearing on the life of a believer. The Jewish celebrations were started, established by God as signs to point to Jesus. Not things for us to follow and observe and think that somehow we get something from God for it. Protestant reformer Martin Luther <laughs> refused to have anything to do with his Roman Catholic past if it wasn't clearly taught in the New Testament. There were no special chairs for the Pope or for the bishop or for the priest. There were no special robes or perks for priests. There was no purgatory, no Pope and no priesthood. There was no forgiveness of sins by religious deeds or observance of made up holidays. You know, the Roman Catholic Church celebrates a religious holiday almost every day to some saint and the saints all have powers over different things. So if you want healing, who do you pray to? St. Jude. Or you make an offering to St. Jude at the church. You put some money in the thing or you light a candle. That's absolutely no different than what they were doing to Zeus and Zizamine 2,000 years ago. There were no altars, there are no crucifixes, there are no statues, no prayers to saints, no salvation outside of Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone. The Roman Catholic Church, the official doctrine is Mary is your co-redemptress. Mary is your co-savior. She redeems you as much as Jesus does. And Luther said, I'll have no part in it because it's not biblical. And Luther's mentor came to him and he begged Luther, take it easy. Don't push reform so hard. Don't preach following the Bible. His words were, but Martin, if we get rid of all these things, the practices so many common people cling to, what will we give the people in their place? And Luther answered without any hesitation, Why, sir, we will give them Christ. Yes, we will give them Christ. And Christ is the answer. Jesus is the answer. Not a statue, not an offering, not your works of law or good deeds. Amen. But the grace of God in Jesus Christ by faith is all the Bible. That's the message of the gospel that the Galatians had walked away from. Give people Jesus. They don't need religious holidays because nobody has the power to set up a religious holiday today. When we create or we follow these religious systems and traditions and observances and rituals that God never told us to do. God never told us as a church to do that in the New Testament. We're no longer Christians. We've created a new religion. If God didn't tell us to do it in the scriptures in the New Testament, we have created a new religion. Why would anybody who's been saved from sin and from death and the condemnation of the law, from slavery and separation from God, ever want to go back to that? By choice. 
Paul was literally beside himself as he wrote this letter. Remember the first chapter. He takes them back and he says, why would you want to do that? And he ends with this phrase. Listen, look at verse 11. I am afraid for you. Why? Lest my labor has been empty. I have poured my life into you. I preach to you with all my heart every Sunday. I opened the scriptures and preached the gospel to you. And now you're walking away from the gospel of grace? Was all of my work for nothing? Because that's how it feels. You are abandoning Christ and going back to the law. You don't see it there, but at the end of verse number 11 is a little frowny face. (laughs) Because that's exactly what Paul is saying. I pastored that church in Portland for 15 years. And then when I left, some of you went back to what you were before. You thought you could please God by your works, by your efforts. You abandoned the grace of God, and in reality, you abandoned God himself. That's what Paul is saying. That's what I could say. The emptiness of ministry, the emptiness of idols, the emptiness of religious shadows, lives of emptiness. Why would you go back after what God has done? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here today. And next week we'll take up verse number 12.